Hi, I'm Peter Laws and welcome back to the Flicks that Church Forgot, the show that explores the deeper and sometimes spiritual themes of horror movies. Right now it's Christmas, way! Hey, it's a time of gifts and giving and of laughter and family of eggnog and thick fog and rotting corpses creeping through the snow to kill your granddad. Yeah, tonight we step into the spectral spirit of the season with Ghost Story from 1981. I will take you places where you have never been. Start. I will show you things that you have never seen. Beginning. And I will see the life run out of you. Long ago, on a cold, dark night, in this peaceful New England village, something happened. Something too terrifying to remember. Something too frightening to forget. Something that has remained a secret until now. Did anyone else see these? Am I the only one having nightmares? Universal Pictures presents Fred Astaire, Melvin Douglas, Douglas Fairbanks Jr., John Hausman, Ghost Story, from the terrifying best-selling novel by Peter Straub. Who is this? He's found a picture of her. That's not possible. The girl, the men, the evil, silence. Dad, I'm telling you something happened. I'm telling you something. I think he may have been murdered. The house, the fear, the nightmare, the vengeance, the terror, the truth. Not now, Rick. Yes. Now. Something's happened. Something terrible. I fear that more of us are going to die. No, we, we, we must talk about it. Ah, uh, she is not the person that you think she is. <laughs> Who are you? Oh, no, please, let's not stop. She's worried you have the wrong idea about her. Everything about her is wrong. No, please, please let me talk Dave, about her. Get away from her, Dave. <laughs> what are you? She's dangerous. Listen to me, please. <laughs> Soon they will learn that they have never been forgiven. <laughs> Ghost story. The time has come to tell the tale. Now, people might think that horror fans are allergic to the positivity of Christmas, that maybe, uh, you know, it's not something that horror people should enjoy. But me, I love this time of year for all sorts of reasons. I love the fun, the magic of it, the twinkly lights, the permission to eat like a pig with little or no thought to heart disease. That can all come next month. Some people complain about the commercialism, commercialization of Christmas and how tacky it is. But hey, I, I like popular culture and I'm very happy to embrace the cheesy quirk of Christmas time. So I, I, yeah, I like Christmas. I think it's great. Um, but what I also find fascinating is that even Christmas offers something for the horror fan. There's a tradition of creepiness at this time of year where it seems somehow fitting to tell supernatural tales to each other. Despite it being a happy and a comforting time of the year, uh, I'm thinking ghost stories in particular are something we tell at Christmas time. Why does that happen? Why do our cultures still delve into horror at the most wonderful time of the year? Well, there's various reasons for that. I dive into some of them in an audio podcast from last year, which you can check out, which asked whether ghosts fit into a Christian worldview. But here are just a few additional thoughts to that um, on why Christmas is a good time for ghosts. Number one, the central idea of Christianity is that God became a man at Christmas. Uh, the supernatural, the spirit sort of enters our physical world, supposedly. Now, this is a pretty fascinating and unique idea in the world of religion that a divine being would become a human. It's called the Incarnation. And as well as being like a really wonderful idea, it's also pretty freaky too. The word Incarnation comes from the Latin word caro or can. Uh, where else do you hear the word can? Well, chili con carne, carnivore, carnosaur, it literally means meat. So even the carnation flower is named that way because of its fleshly color. So the central idea of Christianity um, is that God decided to become meat. Yeah, the, the idea of Jesus is that in some ways it's God in a meat suit, uh, fully human and fully divine. Um, though he's got a better cosmic tailor than Lady Gaga. This is supposedly a fully human, fully divine person. So straight away, the traditional Christmas idea 
is that the supernatural steps into our world. Ghost stories, I think, follow that tradition. Um, you know, the, the dead, it's supernatural. They come alive, as it were. It's a similar principle. A spectral being join us in a way that we can understand. They won't even communicate with us. Also, Christmas is a time of family, and it's a, time, it's a sad fact of life that not all of our family members are living. So as the living members of our families trek through the snow and highways and motorways, there's a thought that, what if the dead ones in our family are going to come back too? What if that scraping sound of the window is them wanting to join the gang again? Perhaps the tradition of Christmas uh, ghost stories might purely be about logistics. As the cold, murky nights slip in, it's a perfect time. Uh, an environment to gather around a roaring fire and tell stories and when the wind is howling through the gaps in the door and the white wisps are sliding past the window it feels fairly natural it's a natural atmosphere in which to sell to tell spookier sorts of stories maybe it's just because charles dickens set the tone with his ghost story a christmas carol that keeps returning every single christmas in one guise or another um you might say that Dickens is one of the most persistent haunters of the modern Christmas. Whatever the reason, there's a tradition of telling tales of the dead returning at Christmas, which to me is just one of the reasons uh, to love Christmas. Second sight video of Time Their New Horror Blu-ray release. Perfectly, they've just put out Ghost Story from 1981 in Time for Christmas. The film itself might not necessarily be set at the festive time, but it's a supernatural tale that is filled with the wintry snow of a small New England town. Check out this matte shot from the, the beginning of the film. Uh, it really just looks, does look like a classic Christmas card to me. Now the film Ghost Story is based on a smash hit novel by Peter Straub and I first read it in my early teens and I suggest that if you haven't tried the book yet you should really stick it on your reading list for 2016. It's a spooky, thoughtful, unconventional ghost tale which crawls under your skin and creeps around there long after you close the book. I love the opening lines of um, Ghost Story for example which says, what's the worst thing you've ever done? I won't tell you that but I'll tell you the worst thing that ever happened to me the most dreadful thing. I love these sorts of ominous openings to books like that, and it's a really interesting book. Anyway, Straub mentions in the extras of the Second Sight disc that he wrote Ghost Story to widen his scope as a writer, and you really get that impression of a sense of big vistas and time and characters. It's an ambitious book. So much so that when it was bought up by Universal to make into a movie, uh, there was clearly going to be some issues in terms of editing. Straub's book is uh, too big for a film, you could say. In fact, I reckon some Hollywood producers would do well to make this into a mini-series, this book. It'd be a fantastic horror drama box set. But back in 79, the movie rights were bought even before the book was published, and so the entirety of the story would have to be drilled down or boiled down into a couple of hours. In other words, Ghost Story is quite a different animal than the book. I find it pointless why anybody would complain about that. Film is obviously a different medium. It's got a limited time frame. It's a different sort of language. So anyone expecting to find Straub's book fully replicated in the 1981 film are going to be disappointed. But they deserve to be disappointed for being naive to think you could cram that whole book into two hours. I also should point out that Ghost Story has the reputation in some circles as being a bit of a crappy film. That it was a missed opportunity. Watching it again, though, it is odd because I can see why critics might not like it. The melodrama of it and the odd tonal shifts. And I can see why it, the, these things would annoy some audiences. But re-watching it years later, I was really drew in to the, drawn into this film. And I found myself thinking of Ghost Story and its world quite a lot since I watched it last week. Now the film instantly shows its unusualness in that it centers around a group of four elderly men. They're part of something called the Chowder Society and it's one of those cool like you know like these gentlemen's clubs that you only ever see in horror films and TV dramas where like a bunch of fellas dress up in dinner suits for dinner you know they, they sit down swill brandy by the fire and they tell each other stories 
Funnily enough, it's a setup that's very similar to a BBC TV series that I reviewed last year called Supernatural. You can check that out, uh, the episode of that podcast. I think it was from last Christmas. But that also had a gentleman society where they told each other stories, though they had a rather more intense entry requirement. If their story failed to scare the members, they'd be killed bit disproportionate if you ask me but anyway i'm not an aristocrat so how would i know um the charter society however uh, they're, they're an elegant bunch of four men who've been friends since they were young guys young, young, young fellas and friends that share a secret that they never talk about but you get the sense that in a roundabout way the only way they can talk about this secret is by telling each other these unrelated stories of horror it's a cool nod to the idea that we can use stories to deal with realities that are too dreadful to articulate more on that later but anyway just because they don't want to talk directly about this horrible past incident there is someone in the film who very much wants to address this incident from the past you see the child of society are being plagued by horrific dreams then when one of their sons falls to his death from a skyscraper they start wondering if the figure that's haunting their nightmares at night may well be walking the waking world as well hence ghost story see Get it <laughs> now one of the features that got ghost story a lot of uh, marketing dollars at the very beginning wasn't just because this was a film that was based on a best-selling novel um, this was in the midst of the Stephen King boom remember so horror novelists were quite popular it's also um, down to the actors who play the four guys to some audiences their names might elicit a vague shrug of recognition but back in the 1980s these were solid symbols of old Hollywood royalty Fred Astaire is probably the most globally recognisable name, I reckon. Um, he cropped up in the brilliant Towering Inferno a few years earlier. Um, then there's Douglas Fairbanks Jr. I would say he's the coolest looking of the child of society with his semi-hipster glasses. You get the impression that um, he's the one who gets all the girls down at the retirement home. The next two members are um, no strangers to horror audiences. John Houseman was famous for many films, but... Um, let me be honest, I reckon he's stuck in most genre minds because of his turn as the storyteller in John Carpenter's The Fog. Ironically, Houseman opens this film in an almost identical way uh, to how he opens The Fog. Um, his voice rumbles over the soundtrack saying, a little after midnight or something. And it's like, huh? It's like the same film. It's the same opener, but obviously it's not the same film. And finally, we get Melvin Douglas, and I'd say he's my favourite of the Child of Society. He's, he cropped up in the brilliant and frankly superior ghost film, The Changeling, uh, the year before. But what I like about Douglas is that in Ghost Story, he's the best actor. Or at least, I, I would say, he's given the most to do in terms of emotion. Especially in a touching scene with his wife, played by another Hollywood legend, Patricia Neal. She's best known to cult movie fans as Helen Benson in 1951's The Day the Earth Stood Still. So anyway, the presence of these, you could say, gold-plated actors certainly gives this film a sense of class. But it's not the only thing that does that. The photography in Ghost Story is beautiful from Jack Cardiff. He worked with Hitchcock and Powell and Pressburger, including work on Black Narcissus from 1947, which has to be one of the scariest non-horror movies of all time. The film's lighting is also really well done, and the music soundtrack to Ghost Story is one of the most bombastic and sumptuous orchestral scores to a horror film that I own. I um, bought the score to Ghost Story decades ago, and at first I found it hard to get into because it's so dramatic. But after a few listens, it really is a superb classical music soundtrack. I mean, think of the minimal soundtrack to John Carpenter's Halloween, and then head as far as you can in the opposite direction, the opposite lavish direction, and you'll find the soundtrack to Ghost Story. There's also something else that seems to add a sense of class to these movie, this movie, and it's an English accent. You see, nothing says sophistication like an English accent, though not necessarily my accent, which is a little odd. Here in Britain, I keep being mistaken for um, an American. I'm not quite sure why that happens. Anyway, this English accent in Ghost Story comes courtesy of Alice Krieger. Uh, she isn't actually English, she's got a South African accent in real life. But here she puts on a flawless, posh Englishwoman voice that makes her both decadent and exotic in this setting. It's like an old English voice speaking into a New England America's world. It's, it's like the new world is still being haunted by those from the previous one, which is quite nice. But as well as classy, um, the English voice can be very creepy. So Krieger delivers some especially chilling 
lines of dialogue. For example, when most guys argue with their girlfriend, she'll tend to say stuff like, I can't believe you forgot my birthday, you idiot. Krieger, on the other hand, stares into her man's eyes and says stuff like, and I will see the life run out of you. <laughs> like, whoa, you know, I'm not really sure why the English accent um, it makes us look like male malevolent baddies, but um, certainly it seems to work with Krieger. She, she's got a great choice for this role, her accent and her acting. It's not just the four old men who have to deal with spooky Miss Krieger. The man who has the majority of scenes with her is Craig Wasson. Now, he plays the son of Douglas Fairbanks Jr. And I like Craig Wasson. I, I first saw him in this and then in Brian De Palma's Body Double and then, of course, Nightmare on Elm Street 3, The Dream Warriors. Um, I, roller coaster as well. I just thought he really stood out as someone who was a little different. He delivers a sort of naturalistic acting style, which has been really underused in Hollywood. These days, he spends a lot of his time reading audiobooks on top or for top authors like John Grisham and Stephen King, which is fine. But I, I wish someone would, you know, give him a few more movie parts. Anyway, the plot starts to entwine together with the old men fearing someone from their past and Wasson meeting the mysterious Krieger and starting a romantic relationship with her. Now, both Krieger and Wasson certainly earn their salary in Ghost Story. They both get pretty naked. Wasson gets full-on stripped for a special effects sequence that comes near the start, which, <laughs> oh man, which is frankly the, the funniest bit in the whole film, the falling from a building sequence at the start. It, it's easy to be unfair on this effect because what they achieved with it is actually pretty clever. A falling man with no wires attached, but he's naked. But it just looks a bit insane on screen, and Wasson's facial expressions look like he's channeling a chipmunk. Still, though... The sequence as a surreal moment from a nightmare is kind of scary as well as funny. So, Wasson lets it all hang out here, but so does Krieger. A lot. In fact, some might argue that the filmmakers had her be naked a little bit too often. That's not to say that she isn't beautiful or anything, but there are moments when um, the nude scenes uh, make sense for the plot and others where it feels a little bit excessive, like they're trying to squeeze in a little skin to please the um, exploitation crowd. Um, for a film that has just such a pedigree in classy production, I just couldn't decide whether or not this was appropriate or not. I'm not sure, I don't mind. Um, anyway, none of it detracts from Krieger's uh, performance, which is really, I would say, the beating heart of Ghost Story. The other exploitation element that you'll find in this is a bunch of jump scares, which some reckon uh, don't fit the, f the tone of the film. The movie is a thoughtful, atmospheric type film. But Ghost Story, um, apparently, you know, the, the, the producers thought that maybe there weren't enough jump scares and the, the critics um, said that because they put these jump scares in, it made it a different sort of film. Me, though, I am quite happy to have those jump scares in, I think, not least because they are... Actually, the jump scares are, are, are largely created by um, the legendary Dick Smith. And um, I remember the first time I saw this film as a young teenager, those were, that was one of the things that stuck out in my mind, the jump scares. I mean, they are handled pretty well, and the dripping effects and cool and creepy corpses, uh, they really work. And I really did jump. And you will jump too if you play this disc loud enough through your system. As an aside, a few other things that really stood out to me when I first saw this was the foot on the breast moment in the bathroom scene. I'd never really seen that in a film before as a teenager, and I still haven't since. To a teenage boy, this odd moment in the film stuck in my memory for obvious reasons, but it was really just quite quirky as well. The other moment that really stuck with me is the is a plot move that happens towards the end, which I won't share, I, I won't tell you now, but it's by far the most heart-stopping heart moment in the story. And it's one of the most memorable, yet still classy jump scares of an entire movie, and this one is done without Dick Smith. So yes, the tone of Ghost Story is a little uneven, but only if you insist on forcing the film into a particular genre straitjacket. Treat the film as being whatever the heck it wants to be, and you'll find that it's working its own charms. There's other stuff too, I think, to like about Ghost Story. The work of legendary matte painting artist Albert Whitlock, Whitlock is one of them. He provides a bunch of artwork for the film, some of which is, is really stunning. There's a great little extra exploring his work in the film where they show a bunch of examples of his matte paintings. But to be frank, I found this extra slightly confusing, only in the sense that I was convinced that many of the pictures they were showing were real photographs of locations. So much so that I had no idea of the, where the painting started and the real location began, which is actually impressive and just is testament to his, to his artistry, as it were. 
Oh, and there's also a little turn in the film by actor Ken Olin. He became most famous for his portrayal of Mike Steadman in 80s hit drama 30 something. I was in my mid teens when 30 something came out, which makes it kind of weird to think I got so into that show, but I did. I just love the dialogue and writing of it of 30 something and the characters. See, it's true. I don't only watch horror films. However, Despite me saying that Ghost Story is a classy professional production, there's moments that feel surprisingly slapdash in the film. There's a scene when Melvin Douglas, for example, has a conversation with his wife, I mentioned that earlier, when he encounters a scary ghost thing at his house. And sadly, uh, a lot of this was cut from the final movie, but it's just the cut itself is very noticeable. You hear the chop in the music so blatantly that I had to rewind it just to check. It's a surprisingly ropey bit of editing, which you can imagine prompted shaking heads and rolling eyes from the distinguished crew at the premiere. Um, plus, it's a shame because it cuts out a cool, big mouth, blank faced demon ghost, which would have looked cool in the film, but they, Irvin, the, the director, decided to get rid of it. Also, the film ends a little bit too abruptly. The story rattles along at a great pace, and then suddenly you're thinking, oh, there's only 10 minutes to go. How did that happen? Maybe a TV miniseries wouldn't necessarily have that problem. Now, turning to the deeper themes of Ghost Story, there really is, I, I, there's quite a lot you could highlight. Um, I read an excellent and exhaustive um, analysis of the film by an uber fan of the movie, Kenneth Sundberg. You can find that at kenetti.fi. He described the film as a highly moral tale of growing up and I think he's right it certainly has that feeling of you know like when you live your life and, and you, you go through a moment it might be tragic and it flips a switch on your reality and you suddenly realize you know you're not an innocent kid anymore and I wonder maybe you can think back on your life was there a trip switch moment then you suddenly felt I am no longer a child I'm a grown-up that the world is actually scary and bleak in a way Ghost Story is about that moment when the child of society, for want of a better cliche, lose their innocence. He also suggests, Sunberg suggests, that the film explores the idea of sons having to deal with the sins of their fathers, which it does. He makes an interesting point as well that I haven't heard many people say before. He says that in some ways he prefers the film Ghost Story to Straub's book. His reason for this is quite interesting. He reads a lot of B-movie style books where the monsters are always evil and had to be destroyed in the end. And he argues that Straub's book does something similar to that. That whereas in the film, the film presents the monster or the ghost as a more sort of sympathetic and relatable thing. Um, I loved Straub's book, but it's an interesting point that Sundberg makes. Unlike Sundberg, I quite like Straub's explanation of what this is all about at the end too. I just reckon the film and the, and, and the book are just two separate things. Just treat them separately. The film's certainly the more traditional ghost story approach. For me though, there's a theme I really picked up from the film. Something that's stuck with me since I, um, since I stopped watching, and that uh, is the danger of suppressing painful truth. The Child of Society are a group of men who've all went through this terrible time together in their youth, yet they haven't told anybody about it. The fact that they're all old men makes this even more powerful and poignant. But this isn't just a few decades of secrets. It's a lifetime of secrets that they've had to deal with. And you get the sense that Ghost Story is saying, no matter how much you try to blot out the bad things in your life, the secrets, they are going to slowly make their way back to the surface, including the bad ones, especially the bad ones. Yet these guys are stiff upper lip types who not only keep their secret from their community and even from their wives, but they crucially keep it from each other. They never ever talk about this incident from the past. And I found this uh, a moving irony that these four men were in this society together and yet were having to deal with the pain on their own. Makes you wonder, 
and question the point of communities. If we have no place we can share our hurt, then what's the point of a community or a society? But on a subconscious level, they have to talk about this and sell their weekly sharing of brandy and horror tales and this indirect way of dealing with the past, like I flagged up earlier. But they refuse to deal with it directly themselves. Even more heartbreaking is the fact that one of the men does want to talk about this incident from the past, but the rest don't let him. Melvin Douglas is the most emotionally satisfying character out of the Chowder Society, like I said, um, and this is because he's just far more open about the pain he's struggling to deal with. There's a scene that I think perfectly sums up this theme. Watson and the Chowder Society are discussing the very real possibility that something supernatural is is going on in their lives. They won't share the story of their past, not yet, but Douglas longs to just get it out there. He he sits at the table, hands curled in bony fists, pleading with them. We have to talk about it. We please, please let me talk. Let me talk, please. He's like pleading with them. Now our modern culture is very in tune with the danger of bottling stuff up. Many of us still do it though. These guys though, like they're like symbols of a bygone age where you just had to get on with life and not make a fuss. And so when Douglas is crying out to do what they should have done years ago, which is to be honest and speak about this incident, he's still being silenced by the old culture around him. Even Craig Wasson, the young guy, doesn't help either. In that scene, I expected him, I longed for him to say, come on guys, let's listen to this bloke. Let, let, let him share what he's, what he's feeling. But they don't. A traumatized man is effectively told, shut up, do not open your heart. It, it wouldn't be proper or wise. But of course, the power of keeping anger, pain and resentment inside is that it can grow and grow till it's out of control. In some ways, Krieger isn't much better. She's a woman that has been hard done by, I agree. But in the cold loneliness of death, she's allowed her anger to grow slowly into psychotic hatred. At least when she comes back, she gathers people around her to help. Yet forgiveness of these guys is not an option, it seems. What we're left with is a group of characters filled with pride-fueled hurt. The Chowders in particular, they've, they've silenced the talk of past trauma, even though silence and avoiding vulnerability is what got them into this entire mess in the first place. You know, it was an attempt by them to silence that which ought to be spoken. If you know the film, you'll be aware that one of the Chowder society can't bear the thought of a true fact being told about him. And it's that, that pridefulness, which sets the whole nightmare in motion. But then the others are drawn into a conspiracy of silence too that haunts them for the rest of their lives. You know, the whole idea of, um, you know, God putting on a meat suit and coming to us as Jesus at Christmas might sound a little odd, but the point of it was for an infinite deity to connect with people in a way that they could understand. You know, God wasn't into silence with his people. He was into sort of communication, or honest communication. Why else would he supposedly become one of us? Um, it's to communicate with us in a way that we can get. Uh, and one of the things this deity talked about, among others, was, you know, the power of, of honesty, of, of not being liars or hypocrites, but being willing to be ourselves, but also, crucially, to be weak. In fact, Jesus specifically says that there's a power in admitting our weakness. The guys at the Chowder Society will not admit weakness. They refuse to be vulnerable. It's a deadly mistake. It makes me wonder how I might be more honest with my feelings with those around me. And I may be wary of uh, burying that which might refuse to stay buried for long. Now, Ghost Story has been released by Second Sight here in the UK on Blu-ray and DVD. And if you're in America, Shout Factory have also just brought it out on Blu-ray too. And the Second Sight disc is great. Um, there's an audio commentary by the director, John Irvin. Um, there's uh, also a substantial set of talking head interviews. Alice Krieg is particularly interesting in her piece. She talks about how this was her first... This is her first real taste of Hollywood and how she was nervous about the nude scenes and things like that. Um, The film itself has been given a really nice transfer and it does get grainy at times, but on the whole, this is a very classy transfer of a classy package of a classy film. So the disc is great, but it's not exhaustive in the sense that there's quite a lot of deleted scenes in this film that audiences have never seen. It's a shame that they couldn't have been unearthed for the release, but perhaps finding those elements are impossible. That's quite, that's, maybe that's the case. 
So, in short, I'd say do check out Ghost Story, especially at Christmas. It's not a perfect film, and you can pick faults in its tone and its choices, but let me put it this way. I feel like watching it again already. Well, that's it for the Flicks of Church Forgot. Thanks for listening. Be sure to follow me on Twitter, where my handle is Rev Peter Laws, or find me on Facebook at the Flicks the Church Forgot. Or you can visit the website, theflickstheChurchforgot.com. If you want to, you can go to the, through the website and donate to the show, uh, um, because um, it helps to pay things like hosting fees for the audio podcast, which are frankly get, starting to get a little bit pricey, um, since I'm trying to keep all the archive episodes up there. So if you want to, you know, you can donate if you like. Also, you can also read my um, monthly horror column in the Fortune Times magazine in all good news agents now. But until then, try not to keep your painful secrets bottled up too long because they've got a habit of creeping back into your life and throwing you naked from a high building. And don't forget, the flicks the church forgot.